And so we come to the end of summer, unofficially, in Cleveland. It's Friday before Labor Day weekend. I'm sure everybody has plans. We're supposed to have great weather. It's this week in the CLE, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn here with my colleagues, Laura Johnston and Layla Tassi, winding down before we come back next week with a new member of the podcast team and some vigorous discussions on the Cleveland mayor's race. How are you today? Doing okay. Bummed about yeah, he... all the invasive species in our state. <laughs> right. The spotted lanternfly has been oh. found in Cuyahoga County, and that's a bad one. It's not like the caterpillars that are that are munching Lars lawn. And we did just post a story <laughs> answering the questions we asked about those those worms a couple of days ago. And this really does seem like the only time in your lifetime in Ohio you're going to see them. That's what the story says. I hope so. Maybe so. go out and say hi to them because they will not be back. <laughs> or just spread a lot of insecticide on your lawn like I did yesterday. The the line that threw me was treat them like bubble wrap and stomp on them. That sounds icky to That's me. Funny. That doesn't seem like the way to do it. We, All right, we, let's begin. It turns out my kids did actually spot one of these worms. And my husband what? was like, you have to kill them. You have to kill them. And my daughter's crying, but it's a caterpillar, daddy. You know, so it just. <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> These aren't like the spot and lanternfly. You don't have to kill them because they're going to die and they won't be back. The spot and lanternfly is, is really very dangerous to all sorts of plants. It, it's a very interesting looking bug with, you know, red, red and dots and things, but bad, bad, bad. Mm. Okay, let's begin. Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost is sitting on his hands while his Republican colleagues violate the Ohio Constitution by not providing the public with proposed legislative maps by the Wednesday deadline. What did he have to say about that deadline when he sued the U.S. Census Bureau earlier this year? Laura Johnston, there is a two-faced Dave Yost here when... <laughs> When, when it was Republic, when it was a Democratic administration in the way of the deadline, he valiantly sails into court, sending out press releases saying it's hard and fast deadline. We must have the data. When it's his Republican cronies that are sitting on the deadline, nothing. Yeah, it's funny because his stance hasn't changed. He still says it's a hard and fast deadline, and by not meeting it, we're causing irreparable harm to Ohioans. So that is the same. What is different is the action he's taking. He is not suing his Republican colleagues, not suing the governor. He's not suing the Ohio redistricting commission to get this done. He's just saying it's wrong and that's it. And he's not demanding anything. There's no legal repercussions here, but so, right. But, but think about that. I mean, he, you know, he puts out these bombastic press releases. Mm -hmm. So when he sued the census bureau, when it said, we're not going to provide you the data in time, I mean, he sails into federal court. He puts out a press release saying you cannot govern by fiat. The rules are the rules. And when he won, he said, I got the data so that my colleagues can meet the hard and fast deadline. When they completely blow it off, they tell you we're going to blow that off, right. even though it's in the Constitution. He doesn't do a thing. Right. There I mean, is no press release coming from his office. Yeah. But I mean, you can't do that. You have to hold people accountable no matter what party they're in. You're not the attorney general to regulate the Democratic Party. This is shameful. I, I, look, I want to get back to this, too. This is a constitutional mandate. Mm -hmm. The Constitution of Ohio is the entire framework of government. This is this is it. This is the whole thing is set up this way. And Mike DeWine and Keith Faber and Frank LaRose, they're completely blowing it off. Right. And Dave Yost is our one vanguard that can actually compel them to do something. He can go to court and say, you have to do this. You don't have a choice. And he refuses to do so. Right. It's not like they just miss the deadline and they're like, you know, we're getting there. We're sorry. It's late. There's no meeting scheduled. They have not said then when they're going to introduce these maps. And the clock is ticking on the second deadline of September 15th that's baked into the Constitution. But that didn't mean you're totally allowed to blow the first one. It's there for a reason. It's We're supposed to be able to get, get a good look at this and have three public meetings before the September 15th deadline. I wonder if this is the result of the fading of the American media. Ohio used to have robust news voices, Cincinnati and Columbus and Toledo and Youngstown, us, and, and they, they were independent and fierce in holding people accountable, but Youngstown's gone. Toledo is owned by a family of, of Trumpsters, 
And the, the rest of the pretty much the rest of the newspapers in the state are owned by Gannett, which has savaged its staff. So we're the only ones. We're, I mean, I, I have not seen anybody else letting people know that the leaders of the state have abandoned their duties in the Constitution. And I wonder if that's why, that they're figuring, well, we don't get any votes in, in Democratic Northeast Ohio anyway, so who cares what they say? And because nobody else is doing their job, that they figure they can get away with it. I mean, they haven't been that secretive about the fact that they still want to protect their districts. I mean, it, it, this is a political game to them. And, and that's really disheartening. And, you know, even the League of Women Voters, which is usually a stalwart for fair elections and fair districts, isn't getting that riled up about it. The ACLU is saying this isn't fair, but they're not suing. And there was a group of mostly liberal um, organizations that came together that put out a press release. But you're right. You're not seeing massive demonstrations. And I I, I don't I haven't heard like Look, regular people get upset about it. May, maybe that's the result of the Trump presidency, that we had four years of just complete flouting of the rules that wears Americans down and they no longer believe you have to follow the rules. I mean, there, I, it's it's really unfathomable to me that you can have all these elected officials just flagrantly saying, yeah, we're not going to follow the Constitution. But I mean, it's just that's not the way it's supposed to work. And you're right. These groups that have largely been representative of the people are just sitting back. I, it, it really a, a frightening time in in Ohio governance because they're doing it. They're going to get away with it. We will remind people when they run for reelection next year, every single time that, you know, Frank LaRose running for secretary of state knowingly and willfully flouted the Constitution when it came to the importance of the district. The, the, the interesting when, thing is, though, are half the voters going to be like, yeah, he floated the flat of the Constitution because he's re- protecting my, you know, Republican I don't, district. I don't think so. I think people don't agree with violating things like the Constitution. Well, and you're, there's ways to get this job done. They can still manipulate the districts, but they got to follow the rules. And, that's why 70 percent of Ohioans yeah. voted to change the rules. So we're, we'll keep reminding people. We'll keep blaring it. We've got it out on the front page again today of the Plain Dealer, and we're talking about it first on This Week in the CLE. What is Ohio Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor doing to try and head off an eviction deluge now that the national moratorium on evictions is over? Leila Atassi, we keep talking about the possibility of an eviction deluge. We haven't seen it, but there are some efforts being made to block it. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, I'm I'm sure that deluge is coming. You know, during her state of the, the judiciary address, O'Connor said that judges should connect tenants and landlords with federal COVID relief funds for past due rent. After, you know, the Supreme Court ended that moratorium finally on, on evictions last week. And so the courts are expecting this avalanche soon. But O'Connor says that judges should be proactive in steering landlords away from formal court action and instead toward alternative forms of dispute resolution with tenants. And to help that effort, the Supreme Court staff has developed a 100-page toolkit for for the lower court judges to prevent evictions from being filed and and dealing with those that have come through. And among the suggestions are, you know, judges can divert parties to social services before an eviction is filed. They can educate tenants in these cases about their rights and eligibility for assistance. They can connect them to resources if an eviction is filed and granted. And they can collaborate with nonprofits and others to, to launch public awareness campaigns about rental assistance. But, you know, here's what I'm thinking about this. I, I, I really like O'Connor. I like where her head and heart are on this issue and, and other issues. But to be honest, though, I doesn't it seem like a lot of the things she's asking judges to do here should be someone else's job? I mean, there's so many layers of the justice system. And even before a case gets there, I'm pretty sure there are folks somewhere whose job it is to educate tenants on their rights and connect them to resources or raise awareness of rental assistance. And it just strikes me that if we've gotten to the point where the judge has to do all those things, it means none of the safety nets caught that case in time and the system has failed. I mean, right. The system has failed because all that money is sitting there and hardly anybody's using it. I think what she's saying is be the safety net it, when all else fails. With well, funny yeah, is this, that's the have very hundred... last line of, of safety right there. You're, you're already hundred... before the judge. Man, so many people have failed you. <laughs> they have a hundred page toolkit. What could be in a hundred page toolkit for the judges? I mean, it's not really rocket science, right? You you either get them the aid or you get them into a diversion where you mediate something. What could they have? I mean, I would love to see all of the different tools in a hundred page 
book. I'm sure there's a lot of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Maybe it's really big font. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe Layla, you edited it. That 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 would explain how it'd be so long. <laughs> oh, stay! <laughs> That's cold. That's cold for I say Friday. That, I say that based on a conversation we had yesterday about what was it, a hundred and seventy-five inch story you were doing? Yeah, that's with? true, right? <laughs> okay, all right. You're listening to this week in the CLE. Is the trial of Larry Householder, the disgraced former Ohio House Speaker who was accused of masterminding a $60 million bribery scheme to enrich First Energy, getting any closer? Lord Johnston, we kind of had a development in this, but I still feel like that trial is so far away, we can't imagine when it'll begin. Exactly. We're talking next spring or summer. So it could be two years since the beginning of this FBI raid to when we actually see this in court. Federal prosecutors said on Thursday they've given defense attorneys most of the evidence against Larry Householder. They're still trying to obtain some information about an unidentified company. But that evidence adds up to more than 1.2 million records, or as the defense attorney said, a couple hundred thousand pages of documents. So talk about a long, long thing to read through. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Layla, were you editing? <laughs> oh God, it's relentless. <laughs> anyway, so they need time to go through this, right? That's yeah. why the trial's so far off. If you load, you know, boxes and cartons and documents on people, you got to give them a chance to read through it so that they can mount a defense. So, wh- when will the when will we hear something from the judge about what is ahead for these cases? These are important cases for the future of Ohio. Right. U.S. District Judge Timothy Black will meet with lawyers on October 5th. He's expected to set a schedule for future filings, hearings, and possibly the trial. So um, Householder is supposed to be tried with Matthew Borges, a former lobbyist, and that will be, then we'll see when that happens. But you know how trials go. They're not exactly speedy, usually. Yeah, I still think they'll be pleased before it's over. Okay, you're listening to This Week in the CLE. What might we expect if a plank of progressive candidates challenging Cleveland City Council incumbents in the primary election win? Leila Tassi, I've been talking all, all morning about this long story you're edited. It's actually great. <laughs> and you divided great. it into two parts, yes. so it's not that long. It's such a and, terrific story. Go ahead. Yeah, it's Sorry. fascinating. So go ahead. Talk yeah. about what today's installment says. So this is a great story by Courtney Astolfi. We had been hearing from sources and and some nervous council incumbents that there was potentially this slate of challengers coming their way who build themselves as progressives and they're ready to take over Cleveland City Council. So so Courtney went to find out what this is all about. And what she discovered is that indeed there is a political action committee called A Better Cleveland for All, and they are backing eight candidates in seven of council's 14 contestants races. And we get to that math because in one of the races, the PAC is backing two candidates. So these are younger candidates. They're mostly political newcomers. They support progressive policies and they want to reform the culture of city council. So for example, many of them support reforms like finding an alternative to to sending armed police officers to calls involving mental health issues, or they want to change the city's policy on tax abatements for wealthy corporations and focus more on neighborhood restoration. But they also want public comment at council meetings and more transparency and an end to the really dumb council traditions like the unit rule, where if you don't vote along with the Democratic majority on issues that come up at the special caucus meetings, you could be banished from the caucus. And they also hate the tradition of letting outgoing council members appoint their successor. It it leads to the scenarios like the one where Ken Johnson retired so he could become a double dipper and then he chose himself as a successor. (laughs) And, you know, this PAC has been really supportive of this group of candidates. They've provided them with funding, but they've also given them campaign advice, access to volunteers, and they've held mandatory workshops about campaign organizing, economic development, and public safety to kind of establish these co- you know, common ground among the candidates uh, about progressive policy ideas. And the PAC says that the candidates aren't running coordinated campaigns, so they're trying to put to rest that notion that they're running as a slate. But when Courtney spoke to the candidates themselves, they're actually very supportive of one another, and they tell her that to achieve what they want, they do believe that they need to win up and down the ticket. So right, give give a brief preview of the second part, which will publish online tomorrow. Yeah, so tomorrow, Courtney is going to go deeper into 
the the policies that these candidates support involving public safety and economic development. And then she also gives some time to the incumbents who are facing these challengers who say basically that, you know, for one. This next song will make you love your auto and home coverage as much as you love the 80s. Switch to insurance. They're saving me so much. They cover my car and bundle with my home. I feel so secure to say I love insurance. Visit AAA.com slash insurance and save up to 20%. Insurance. Why do they get to call themselves progressives? We, too, are progressive in many ways. But secondly, you know, they don't really seem to grasp how hard it is to do things in government. Right. That, and, you know, we I started hearing about this plank about six weeks ago because incumbents were really anxious about it. They, 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 this is this hasn't really happened before in an organized fashion. The incumbents, when you talk to them, they feel like they have a divine right to keep their seat. This is my seat. How dare somebody try to unseat me? And so the, when they say things like, they don't understand what it takes to govern, it's like, neither did you when you started, and you haven't been doing much of it. I mean, the city council has not spent a dime of the stimulus money. I mean, we've got people right. that are hurting in Cleveland because of 18 months of pandemic that that money could go to start rebuilding and they don't do it because they're all sitting around nattering. Some of them say, come on, city council president, we need to do it. It's like, you're the council, do it, vote for it. <laughs> right. You only need nine votes and you could do whatever you want and they're not. And so they're scared of these folks, which is good. They, you know, this is, it's not just the mayor's race that has a real competition going. You have real competition going on the city council races. I'm going to be fascinated to see if you have enough of a turnover with the new people can take it over. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. And, and, you know, the, the group of people themselves, when you look at their backgrounds, they're, they're so diverse. It's just, it's going to be an exciting primary. I can't wait. We have an editorial that uh, Ted died and it'll be on next Wednesday to discuss. It's going to publish on Sunday that, that talks about this is once in a generation, once in a generation, do you have the chance to completely remake your city government with a fresh approach, both with the mayor and the council? And, and it discusses how important it is that people do that and not settle for the same old, same old, i.e. Dennis Kucinich. You're listening <laughs> to This Week in the CLE. Why did a whole lot of Lake County residents think there was a massive natural gas leak in their neighborhoods the past couple of days? Lord Johnson, I got to tell you, I'd be really disconcerted if I walked outside and thought <laughs> I was surrounded by explosive gas. Right. People thought it was natural gas because there was a really bad smell. But officials from three Lake County communities said the strong odor was coming from Lake Erie. That's that East gross. Lake, <laughs> Metter on the Lake, and Willowick received at least 60 calls regarding this smell on Wednesday night and Thursday morning. And apparently it's just sediment churning at the bottom of the lake. There was a small craft advisory uh, yesterday morning and, and the night before. So it was very windy and wavy. So maybe that's how it turned up that sediment. I don't know. We didn't have it on the west side. So when you swim in the lake, do you get out and just cover yourself with bleach? I know, <laughs> and I did it this morning, actually. I, I'm, and my hair's still wet from the lake. But um no, it didn't smell at all. Like it was fine. So <laughs> I do shower when I come back, but um, yeah, I don't know if that's enough. And so, so the moral of this story is if you smell something, say something. <laughs> <laughs> well, East Ohio Dominion went out to check because it did smell like <laughs> natural gas. There's a very specific odor to natural oh, gas. That's it's like put a sulfur so you smell. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, God, walking outside, you remember, you know, back a hundred years ago, whatever, Cleveland had a massive natural gas explosion wiped out an entire neighborhood. So, oh, so it's a real threat, but it turns out it's just gross stuff at the bottom of the lake. Yeah. Blech. You're listening to This Week in the CLE. Is the battle between Westlake and Cleveland over Westlake exiting the Cleveland water system finally over? Leila Tassi, neither you nor Laura Johnson are going to remember this, but a long time ago when this was beginning, I predicted firmly Cleveland would win this. I just didn't see any way that Westlake could unilaterally pull out, keep really? all the pipes that Cleveland had been maintaining. I mean, Cleveland had made a huge investment in the infrastructure out there. And I thought, there's no way they're going to have to pay a lot of money. 
But really, Cleveland has lost at every juncture. They have. Wait, wait Chris Quinn was wrong. <laughs> way wrong on this Market. one. I, st I still don't get how it how it works. But but Lila, what's the latest? So to be honest, I was shocked to learn that this case wasn't wrapped up by now. I swear I covered this lawsuit a decade ago as a reporter. So the eighth Ohio District Court of Appeals on Thursday ruled against Cleveland in this year's long court fight over water service the city provides to Westlake. Listeners might remember if we take a stroll down memory lane that Westlake years ago wanted to stop buying water from the Cleveland Water Department and instead wanted to hook up to the Avon Lake water system. Cleveland notified Westlake back then that it would raise quarterly fees to residences and businesses to recoup costs associated with all the infrastructure improvements they had done. And that would be, you know, something in the ballpark of $19 million. Westlake sued and won an order blocking those charges. The city then won a ruling in 2016 that allowed it the right to shop for water without financial penalty. So they were, you know, obviously ahead of this, uh, you know, they were they were the winners here. The court also ruled that their 10 year service agreement had come to an end in 2015 and that they were to go to a yearly agreement after then on from then on until Westlake withdrew from the system. And now in this round of litigation, Cleveland sought to have the lower court rule that a five-year discontinuation notice required in the contract should be upheld, and that limiting that notice requirement to one year was impractical because it would take more than a year to cut the water service to the city. But the court was basically like, didn't we already decide that we're on a year-to-year -year contract? And the judge at this point is super annoyed that the city keeps relitigating these questions so, um, you know, I, I personally I'd love to know how much the city has spent on this case. And in, in this most recent ruling, the judge has said that the city of Westlake can recoup their legal fees from Cleveland. Oh, yeah, my I, goodness. <laughs> but but the, I, I just don't I mean, Cleveland has made investments in the infrastructure in Westlake and they just lose it. And I, I, I remember there was some kind of negotiation where they were supposed to be compensated somehow. But, the, but there was a big dispute about how that would work. And Cleveland basically just lost. Um, so I, it, it, look, it's a, it's a big win for Westlake. Cleveland really should stop. I mean, they shouldn't take this any further. It's clear. The courts have made clear what the position is. Uh, I guess they could still take it to the Ohio Supreme court and waste more money on it. Uh, they're going to have to let Westlake go. You're listening to this week in the CLE. How are out of control police chases in East Cleveland figuring into the mayor's race in that city. Laura Johnson, we got a project coming, I think later this month, that will really go deep into the wild, wild west atmosphere of police chases in East Cleveland. Uh, it's staggering what's happening there, and, and there's no control over it because normally the control is you sue the city, but they're broke. <laughs> they have no money, so suing them doesn't mean anything. How is it figuring into the mayor's race? Yeah, this is the precursor that John Coniglia wrote just before the primary for September 14th, because people are challenging Mayor Brandon King. He has four challengers, including three members of council, running to unseat him. And they're looking at these police chases as a major issue in the city. We are up to about 170 chases so far this year. Our reporters looked at the 100 chases in the first four months of the year. That's almost a chase a day through a city of three square miles. And if you've driven through East Cleveland, you know that these are small residential streets, mostly 25 miles an hour, residential or Euclid Avenue with stores on both sides, lots of traffic lights. This is not where you want to be having a police chase. And it's terrifying residents. So mayoral candidates and council went women, Juanita Gowdy and Korean Stevenson, they voted for this law last year named after Tamia Chapman, a girl who was killed in a chase, to stop the chases that other candidates don't want to listen to. And, and basically, the council hasn't been able to enforce at all. It, it, and, you know, East Cleveland is broke, like, like I said. Right. And, and it doesn't seem like, it just doesn't seem like the chases are, are, resonating with the resonance it's no, a strange one and they're chasing over things like speeding and tinted windows and they're ending in crashes and people have been hurt and one person was killed i mean this is not something that you point to as as a beacon of hope for the city but some people in this mayor's race are saying if we don't chase we're going to become you know a black hole of lawlessness and i'm thinking I, I feel like east cleveland already is it's not like the chases are working and and you're right i mean this is so deep and so vast we'll have a number of stories looking into it but it is staggering it's just like how can a modern city in the 21st century 
operate like this. Yeah, good stuff to come on Cleveland.com and in the Plain Dealer. You're listening to This Week in the CLE. What does a new Cleveland Clinic study say about how men want to interact with their doctors when it comes to discussing sexual health? Well, Tassi, you never know what the Cleveland Clinic is going to study. This one was in a, kind of had an unusual set of results. Yeah, yeah. So 44% of men would prefer to, to discuss their sexual health over a virtual visit with their doctor as opposed to in person. And this was a study conducted by the clinic that surveyed 1,000 men across the nation. And they, they were pretty, pretty interested interesting results. They found that younger generations are more open to virtual visits with 41% of millennials and 36% of Gen Z adults preferring an online visit compared to 9% of baby boomers. And uh, this is part of the clinic's Mention It campaign with the emphasis on men, get it? (laughs) So the aim is to raise awareness of health issues that men don't typically talk about during their doctor's visits, but that could be harbingers of underlying disease. And this year's survey focuses on the barriers to care that affect the ability of men of color to get health care and the cultural differences surrounding discussions of men's health issues such as infertility or erectile dysfunction. Among some of the findings, more men of color than white men say they haven't visited their doctor in the past year and that it's hard to get time off work to do it. And yet quite a number of health issues afflict communities of color disproportionately. African-Americans are six times more likely to develop kidney failure from hypertension. African-American men are also more likely to have the more dangerous types of prostate cancer. Hispanic men are more likely than white men to have diabetes and and diabetes-related kidney failure and to die from it. So very um, eye-opening, you know, results. You know, I, I get the idea of convenience. I mean, I've never done a virtual doctor's visit. I've always done it in person, but I, I understand that. I don't understand the divide when it comes to discussing sexual health. I, I mean, I don't know why that would be easier for some people to do virtually than in person. It's, it's just, that's an odd finding to me. I, um, I but, suspect but, that the 9% of baby boomers I, I I don't necessarily think that means that most are more comfortable discussing in person. I just think they're less comfortable with technology, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's it. No more age of statements from you. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. You're listening to this week in the CLE. Does the new Cleveland Hopkins International Airport station for rental car offsite parking and hotel shuttle drop offs solve all the problems that the airport created when it shoved people using those services into a very inconvenient place in 2015? Lord Johnston, this is another story that seems like it's been going on forever, but is it over? No, no, it's never over <laughs> at the airport because this is kind of a stopgap to when they want to redo the entire airport. And of course, that's a big question mark if they're ever going to do that. But this is a $3.5 million project, years in the making. And and they're trying to ease congestion on this increasingly crowded roadways in front of the terminal. Because remember, we used to be a hub. And if you're a hub, people fly into you and then fly out. And now we're basically just, you know, we live here, we get on the airplane. So construction started in March of 2020 for this new spot north of the terminal, just off the baggage claim area. It was supposed to be completed last year, but COVID supply shortages stopped it and some underground work. And now it's finally open. You have um, new benches, I believe. You have canopies over top, safer um, signage. It's just a better place to be. But no, and, and if you are going to your rental car or you're picking up, uh, shuttle bus for offsite parking. You'll be using that. Okay, that 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 I I do remember how bad it was. I mean, I the the place they were sticking people was not protected from the weather, and you know we get really nasty weather in the winter here. And for people that had disabilities, having to go up and down the escalators right. and all that that, that was kind of nonsense. Uh, I what was surprised me in 2015 is when they finished the work, they just didn't bring it back. And when this exploded into a huge controversy, they stumbled all over themselves. So, so it's six years later, they finally come up with an interim solution. 
you know, this this makes me question anew. Shouldn't the airport be run by the entire region with a bunch of regional control? Is it really in the best interest to have the city doing it when it bumbles this badly? Well, and I'm still a little confused because in six to eight weeks, taxis are going to move to the new facility. So they're not there yet. And then Uber and Lyft drivers will pick up passengers at the cab's former location on the lower level at the south end of the terminal. But if you just got off a flight and you see Ground Transportation Center, aren't you going to figure that's where Uber and Lyft is going to pick you up? Like now we're talking about two opposite sides of the airport. Yeah, I it, it, look, I, I, I don't quite get it. And and everybody talks about the coming transformation with the two billion dollar plan. They don't have any money to do that. I, it's hard to envision maybe, what the future maybe is. Maybe we'll hear from listeners who have used this new center and they can tell us whether it's a, an improvement or that they're just rolling their eyes at, at this. <laughs> OK, you're listening to this week in the CLE. That does it. Call it a summer, right? It's time to head into fall. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Layla. Thanks to everybody who listens to this podcast. We'll be back Tuesday, taking the holiday off on Monday. ACAST powers some of the world's best podcasts. Here's a show we recommend. Hey, I'm Bert from The Burt Show. You have people on a show that really don't like morning shows. Blair said, I think I'm falling in love with you, and I went... Why take initiative when you can take a nap? I like keeping it real, and I like keeping it gross. <laughs> so we created a show that we really wanted to hear. It's real, and it's funny, and we will talk about our personal lives. We're not scared of anything. I'm on the phone with your husband, Bart, and he says, I love you. I'm not <laughs> sure that I gave him a confident enough I love you back. And I do have feelings for him. I, I think I'm falling in love with him. What I love most about this show is everybody's vulnerability. And though our perspectives may be different, working together is actually fun. We put the fun and dysfunction. I think it's unlike anything that you've heard before. The Burt Show. Listen to this show on ACAST or wherever you get your podcasts. ACAST, 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 ACAST recommends. recommends.